deliverance from all future rebirth, old age, disease and death from all suffering and misery. The absolute extinction of the life-affirming will, which is no, just another way of saying the craving to be, which is uh, sometimes when we think of um, life energy, that's all it is. Life energy is a polite word for think, for craving to be. That's what we've got. We've got craving to be, and we can find that wherever we look in nature. And I was just mentioning that today, that we can see trees growing what seems to be rock. There doesn't seem to be the slightest bit of soil and yet their roots are on top of the rock, and yet they're growing nicely. Well, that's craving to be. I've seen that many times. One of the very fine examples of that is the Monterey pine, which is uh, on the Monterey Peninsula, often depicted in picture postcards. It's standing alone on top of a rock, and one can hardly see any, I didn't see any soil at all. And sometimes if you have ever grown your own vegetables, if one, for instance, plants uh, carrots, now the seeds for carrots are extremely small, so it's very difficult to space them properly. So very often you will find that one has put the um, seeds too closely together. So what what you get then are two carrots like... uh, twisted around each other like a corkscrew because both of them want to grow. They just, but neither one of them has enough room to grow. So they twist around each other and they look like a corkscrew. And uh, it's craving to be. This is what we have. And craving to be is, of course, for us, it uh, results from the, th- from the idea that we're really here as somebody special. And uh, when we lose that, then we lose that craving to be. So that's what this is all about. Out of another discourse, extinction of greed, extinction of hate, extinction of delusion, this is called Nibbana. Well, delusion always means, uh, means the ego delusion. And just to make that quite clear, which wasn't clear, for some people, ego delusion and self-delusion are identical when I speak about them. It doesn't mean that an ego delusion means I'm egocentric. A self-delusion makes everybody egocentric. There's no difference whether we call it ego delusion or self-delusion. It's all the same thing. The two aspects of Nibbana are the full extinction of defilement also called Suupadi uh, Sesa Nibbana, Nibbana with the groups of existence still remaining. This takes place at the attainment of arahanship or perfect holiness. What this is all about means that's Nibbana at la- in during lifetime. And the, uh, the groups of existence are the five aggregates. And the five aggregates are there. There's also a cause for enormous misconceptions that uh, sometimes I've heard people discuss it and debate it and argue about it. Whether the aggregates disappear at enlightenment, well, of course they don't. The Buddha was in the full command of all his faculties. <laughs> <laughs> from, from the time he was enlightened on the time of his death. So, this is enlightenment with the groups of existence still remaining. The five uh, aggregates are there, body and mind. And then there's a full extinction of the groups of existence, also called anupadisis and nibbana. Nibbana without the groups remaining, in other words, coming to rest, or rather the no more continuing of the psychic psycho-mental process of existence. 
this takes place at the death of the uh, uh, Arahant. We usually call it Parinibbana. Parinibbana is a word for the death of the Buddha. And uh, it means Nibbana without remainder. That's what this is all about. It always seems to be explained in a complicated way. Um, so at that time, of course, the um, five uh, aggregates are not remaining. There's no remainder of anything. So the body is disappears and, uh, of course, the uh, aggregates have disappeared altogether. So that's Parinibbana. Sometimes both aspects take place at one and the same moment, namely at the death moment. And it has been said by the Buddha at certain, in certain suttas that the death moment, if one has practiced ni- uh, well, is an excellent moment for full enlightenment because one's got to go, let go. One is forced to let go. Even if until then one has been hanging on here, there, and, and this and that, one has to let go. Now, obviously, not everybody who dies has the opportunity for full enlightenment because one has to have some sort of practice behind one. But a person who has practiced maybe has had past moments but not the last one, it's very likely that they will get the last one at death. And even a person who has had no past moments but has practiced very well and has understood the uh, um, the non the substance the non substance of the being will be able to have at least the first past moment. So the the being forced to let go, and that's why the Buddha has so many times said that one should every day look at one's own death so that one can already get enlightened now and not have to wait till then because it might take some time. I mean, one might actually become 80 or more than that. So it might take a long time till one has that chance. So looking at one's death now may may make it quite clear that this is going to happen and one might be able to use that to help one on this thing, on this path. So it takes often place um, uh, at the death. And then there's a uh, quote uh, from the Anguttara Nikaya, from uh, one of the discourses, several discourses. This, O monks, truly is the peace. This is the highest, namely, the end of all formations, the forsaking of every substratum of rebirth, the fading away of craving, Detachment, extinction, nibbana. The end of all formations is, of course, at the moment, the past moment, there is no formation. But as long as the aggregates exist, as long as body and mind exist, there will be formation again, because formation is primarily mental formation. So, um, but forsaking every every bit of the possibility for rebirth. The Arahant does not have any rebirth. Now here Nibbana has the the two other um, or maybe even three other explanations. It's a fading away of craving, it's detachment, it's extinction. But fading away of craving leads to detachment, leads to extinction. So Nibbana translated as extinction. Nibbana has many translations. So this is one of them, extinction. But the word extinction is not one that I'm very much in favor of because it sounds as if we are extinguishing something that exists. It sounds like annihilating nihilism. It isn't that at all. What we're extinguishing is a delusion. That's all. If we, were, if we have a delusion about something, let's say we have an idea somebody doesn't like us and we go and ask this person, do you not like me? 
And that person says, not at all, I like you a lot. We have extinguished the delusion. We haven't extinguished that person. It's the same here. Up to now, up to, up to any past moment, we believe that this is a person, this is somebody real. And then we extinguish. So the word extinction needs explanation because otherwise it looks like something terrible. We're extinguishing me. That's dreadful, isn't it? Now here's another quotation. Enraptured with lust, enraged with anger, blinded by delusion, overwhelmed, with mind ensnared, man aims at his own ruin, at others' ruin, at the ruin of both parties, and he experiences mental pain and grief. But if lust, anger, and delusion are given up, man aims neither at his own ruin nor at others' ruin, nor at the ruin of both parties, and experiences no mental pain and grief. Thus is Nibbana visible in this life, immediate, inviting, attractive, and comprehensible to the wise. So we can see from this statement that it is attainable. It's visible in this life. And it's visible in through the aspect. As I said yesterday, unfortunately, we don't get a halo. Uh, but, uh, or maybe fortunately. Um, but it is visible because the person who has attained any of the past moments, particularly the last two, knows him or herself that there is no hate and that there is no greed. It's very, very uh, easily known by the person who has attained that. So, and the delusion, of course, of the self has to be, uh, the non-delusion of self has to be there, otherwise hate and greed will not go. So there's no, one doesn't aim at one's own ruin anymore. So you can see that with hate and greed, one own, aims at one's own ruin. One gets unhappier by, by the moment, the more hate one has and the more greed one has. So one ruins oneself and one ruins others, of course, because one gets angry at them. Huh? So that's invisible in this life, immediate, inviting, attractive, and comprehensible to the wise. These are the Buddha's words. Next, next ones are also Buddha's words. Just as a rock of one solid mass remains unshaken by the wind, even so, neither visible forms, nor sounds, nor odors, nor tastes, nor bodily impressions, neither the desired nor the undesired can cause such a one to waver. Steadfast is his mind. Gained is deliverance. Now, visible forms, sounds, odors, tastes, bodily impressions, these are all our sense contacts. And the desired and the undesired is the either they give us pleasant feeling or unpleasant feeling. So none of that can make the mind waver. It says about the other hand, Although touched by worldly circumstance, never his mind is wavering. The enlightened person lives in the world. It's not um, world forsaking. It is world forsaking only through the insight and the understanding that the world happens to be there but doesn't have any intrinsic value. For, for make giving happiness or peace. It does have one value. It's a very good place to gain enlightenment. That's its most valuable aspect. Every other aspect which we see in this world is delusion. Every other aspect is delusion. This is the only one that's real. It's a wonderful place for enlightenment because we have so many aspects of dukkha in it. So here we can see that uh, he's described the Arahant. He's like a rock and um, none of the sense contacts can, uh, can bring him to the Tsar, to 
to greed or to hate, no matter whether the feeling is pleasant or unpleasant. So it stops right there when we were talking about about this uh, depend origination. Feeling is there, but no craving. The, and the doorway out after the uh, picture of the person that gets the arrows thrown into his eyes, which is very unpleasant feeling, no doubt. Now here's another quotation from the Buddha about Nibbana. There is an unborn, unoriginated, uncreated, unformed, If there were not this unborn, unoriginated, uncreated, unformed, escape from the world of the born, the originated, the created, the formed, would not be possible. If there were not that, we could not get out. So by by inference, there has to be that which is uncreated and unborn. Now to have that which is unoriginated, uncreated, means it's unconditioned. There are no conditions there. It's unborn, and therefore it's also called the deathless. Where there's no birth, there's no death. It doesn't have an origin. It doesn't have any creation or any form in it. So what it is, sometimes we may may be able to explain it as the primary primordial ocean or the matrix of all. But all these are only words. The actual experience is the experience of non-occurrence. And if there's no occurrence, there has to be, there cannot be any birth in it. And there cannot be any death, of course. So that kind of dukkha is gone. Here's another uh, quotation. Hmm. No, this is the Nanati Loka. Then comes the Visuddhimagga. One cannot too often and too emphatically stress the fact that not only for a real, but even for a theoretical understanding of this goal, the realizing of the truth, of the impersonality and emptiness of all forms of existence remains an indispensable preliminary condition without which, according to one's personal materialistic or spiritualistic leanings, one will necessarily consider Nibbana either as annihilation of the ego or as an eternal state of existence into which the ego enters. Hence it is said, ah, yeah, here's the quotation, I think I gave you this quotation already, suffering exists, but no sufferer is found. The deed is, but no door of the deed is there. Nirvana is, but no one to enter. The past is, but no traveler can be seen. This is a quotation from the Visuddhimagga. Here the other one is actually trying to refute two wrong views about Nirvana, which are very common. The one wrong view about Nirvana is that we are annihilating the ego, we are annihilating the self. I've already uh, refer to that, or that there is an eternal state of existence into which we can enter. The me can enter. And this is the thing where the Buddha's explanation and the Buddha's insight differs from the insight which we can see when there's a talk about Atman or when there is this uh, the, um, the joining into the God consciousness. It is me entering into something. The Buddha then says, no, that's not it. We have to see first that the me is a total delusion and then letting go of that and then only the other remains. Is that clear? Okay, good. (laughs) Sometimes when I listen to myself, I'm not quite sure whether I've made it clear. So these are some explanations of Nibbana. It is usually said that the Buddha only explained Nibbana in a negative way. It's not quite true. He has said what it really is. He has also said what it's not. So 
so the, uh, we have both ways, actually. These are some of the quotations from uh, his suttas. I want to get back to our original discourse. Meanwhile, we have heard quotations from quite a number of other discourses, namely the Samanapala Sutta. And as far as we got on the Samanapala Sutta, you may not have been aware of that, was the eighth jhana. <laughs> and then we got to the insight, but the insight was only um, a very brief paragraph and in this sutta. And then I elaborated on all the stages of insight, which have come from many different suttas. This king that he's talking to, this king Ayatasattu, who has murdered his father, was not able to do those inside steps. And that's why the Buddha did not go into details on the inside. He went into the details of the inside in other occasions, and this is what I was um, explaining to you, all the different inside steps. So it's not in here. But what is in here is that after the... Uh, the uh, uh, jhanas and after the insight the insight which leads to full enlightenment Buddha talks about five higher knowledges and four of them are what we would call sup supernormal powers and the supernormal powers he wants should never be used by anyone who is not an arahant, fully enlightened. And there is a quotation here where he says this quite clearly. It's quite interesting, actually. He says, obstruction to meditation. No, obstruction to meditation, obstruction to serenity and insight. A dwelling, family, and gain, a class and building too, travel, kin, affliction, books, and supernormal powers. So all these, these are, these are ten things which are obstructions. And what are, what are meant by the others, maybe I should go into that, one of them is that you're an obstruction for me. One shouldn't have any students. <laughs> <laughs> That's what the class is all about. Class. A dwelling is ownership of, of buildings because they need to be looked after and one has uh, um, attachment to them. But primarily the attachment is is meant. The family is attachment to them. It is that they are important. So the dwelling family and then gain. If one has to have material gain, then that is also an attachment to a totally outside matter. One has to have money or things. Um, a class of students and building, starting to build things. It's one of the worst things one can do. I know all about that one. <laughs> <laughs> I built Nun's Island from scratch, and uh, it's really a, a real obstruction to do that. So building buildings, it's a great obstruction. Um, Well, kin is again, that's a, the family, I mean, kin, it's a relations, a, 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 a attachment to that. Traveling is a, is a great obstruction, of course, because first of all, one can't meditate very well when one is traveling, and then we have, one has to constantly have one's mind on totally different things. One has to be there in time, and one has to, see that one doesn't make any mistakes in what airplane or what train to take and have to get tickets and uh, it's a great obstruction. 
books with books is not reading not meant reading with books it's meant that one is responsible for uh, looking after the uh, the canon or some holy books yeah the responsible for scriptures responsibility for scriptures this does not mean that one shouldn't read not at all and supernormal powers so these are ten obstructions so when the buddha talks about supernormal powers which he does do it is meant for the arahant who can uh, use them or not it's usually those people that become arahant with complete mastery over the jhanas that also also have supernormal powers and since one can have complete mastery over the jhanas without being an arahant that is one thing one must be careful of now this is not uncommon in india uh in india the um the jhanas were long known before the buddha they have been practiced for at least 5000 years they are, they can be found in the rig veda and they're being practiced today of course maybe at a much smaller on a much smaller scale i'm quite sure of that but uh, in certain um traditions i'm sure they're being practiced and they are unfortunately often practiced for uh, and then used for supernormal powers without the attainment of arahantship or enlightenment i should say um it's very difficult then to know because the uh, the supernormal powers are a thing which is so attractive to people when a person has supernormal powers which one considers you know to be supernormal the uh the following immediately goes into the thousands there's no question about it and the buddha warned against that again and again and particularly for any nuns and monks unless they were fully enlightened and even then only in emergencies only if it was really necessary so it's um a thing which can be developed anyone who has the ability and the mastery over the jhanas the mastery over the jhanas is of course it any of the jhanas is immediately available at any time and for any length of time and in the complete depth depth of it just as the buddha didn't hear uh, 1000 uh, ox carts going through the river when he was sitting next to it so that would be a very deep forest jhana so that kind of supernormal power is available but it should not be practiced nor should one try to even go in that direction then takes one's energy away from the path to enlightenment but not only that one will use them egotistically because the ego is still there so one will use them for the gain of fame for the gain of appreciation of being looked up to for any sort of thing which has an ego in it so it should not be used i will just mention what they're called the vine ear which would be able to to hear sounds which are far away and compassing the minds of others means one can read what goes on in other people's minds knowledge of recollecting one's own past lives divine eye but none of this is of any any interest to us the only thing that's of interest to us is the last one and that's the knowledge of the destruction of the canker now this knowledge of the destruction of the cankers is the last thing on the path after having had the fourth path moment arahantship and reviewing knowledge of knowing that no defilements are left then one also knows no cankers are left the word canker is uh, maybe not so easy to understand 
the Pali word is asava and it means the outflow, that what one flows out from oneself. And the cantas are actually, also mentioned in here, the um, that which has been the cause for our roaming around samsara for so long, they're sometimes translated as influxes, but that's no, not much better, is it? <laughs> it's, uh, it's better to think of it as an outflow. Um, sensual desire, craving for existence, and the um, the um, and ignorance. So these these three are again the same ones that are the main cravings we have. So the craving for existence and the craving for craving for sensual gratification arise out of the ignorance of of the non-self. We are ignoring the non-self. So these are the, called the three. Um, yeah, they flow out of us. They're sort of like our vibes. That might be the best way to make to understand it, because we have we are ignoring the non-self and are aware of the self. So because of that, we have this um, we crave to be, and this craving to be has all the connotations that how we want to be and what we want to be, and how we do not like anyone who even puts our ego assertion into the slightest question. If there's a slightest question that somebody isn't completely uh, supportive of our ego assertion, that already is misery then. And I mean, it happens all the time to everybody. That we can't expect the world to come always support our ego assertions. So, that is that is the what flows out of us, the uh, the and then our sensual gratification. So what the Buddha is now telling this king? Huh? When the mind is concentrated, pure and bright, unblemished, free from defects, malleable, wieldy, steady and attain to imperturbability. He directs and inclines it to the knowledge of the destruction of the cankers. So this is used, the word cankers here, so I'll use that. Huh? So when the mind is concentrated, pure and bright, unblemished, free from defects, malleable, wieldy, steady, and attain to imperturbability, that is after the jhanas, it has that kind of uh, that kind of uh, quality in the mind <coughs> and having been able to uh, gain the past moments the mind then understands as it really is this is suffering this is the origin of suffering this is the cessation of suffering and this is the way leading to the cessation of suffering. In other words, understands the Four Noble Truths. And one understands as it really is, these are the cankers. These are, this is the origin of the cankers. This is cessation of the cankers. This is the way leading to cessation of the cankers. So it's no different. The Four Noble Truths talks about Dukkha, and at the same time, one sees that the cankers arise out of the same ego delusion as the for the noble truth arise out of the dukkha. So there's, that is the same thing that one one realizes. The origin of the canker is the ignorance, the delusion, and so is the dukkha. Of course, the, the, its basic uh, cause is that we're thinking that there's somebody here who can suffer. Once we don't have anybody here, there's nobody suffering. Knowing and seeing thus, the mind is liberated from the canker of sensual desire, from the canker of existence, and from the canker of ignorance. It's interesting, because here the existence is called the canker. So 
So existence in itself is already um, an something which is not uh, desirable. When it is liberated, the knowledge arises. It is liberated. One understands the story of birth, the holy life has been lived, what has to be done, had to be done, has been done. There's nothing further beyond this. This is again the traditional sentence after full enlightenment. Now the Buddha is going to give some similes, which I think are always helpful because they're easy to remember, the similes, and they do tell us something that we can use. Great king, suppose in a mountain glen there were a lake with clear water, limpid and unsolid, a man with keen sight standing on the bank would see oyster shells, sand and pebbles and shoals of fish moving about and keeping still. He would think to himself, this is a lake with clear water, limpid and unsolid, and there within it are oyster shells, sand and pebbles and shoals of fish moving about and keeping still. In the same way, great king, when the mind is thus concentrated, pure and bright, the meditator directs and inclines it to the knowledge of the destruction of the cankers and understands as it really is that suffering with the four, the four noble truths and the four truths about the cankers. So this too great king is a visible fruit of recluseship more excellent and sublime than the previous ones. And great king, there is no other fruit of recluseship higher or more sublime than this one. So the Buddha has come to the end of his explanation that this is it. This is the highest that can be, uh, can be attained. And the, the simile he's giving is only that the water of this lake is totally clear so that the mind is totally clear and there is no the mind doesn't is not clouded by desire or craving Buddha at another place also said Nibbana is non-craving as long as there is a slightest craving in the mind and it doesn't matter what the craving is for there has to be somebody there to be the to crave and that's me. And as soon as me is there to crave, there's no clarity in the mind. It becomes foggy. Now, on the path of the four past moments, in the first three, there is still that. The first one particularly, and the second one less, and the third one less, but it's still there. It's only in the arahantship, which is what is talked about here, which is the highest what the Buddha is talking about, that that craving is completely gone. Because no matter what one craves, there has to be somebody there to do the craving. So even if I want Nibbana, that is me wanting it, isn't it? And that's not possible. So there's nothing to want, it's all to get rid of. It all has to go. And one of the first things which have to go in order to get to this state of total freedom is the idea that total freedom can be found in the world. And if we have that idea, if we lose that idea, then we will eventually see in this clarity that there's nothing here. It's all very nice and pleasant, and uh, but it's nothing really. It doesn't have any substance. There's another... Um, explanation of the word corelessness. It's all very nice and everything, but it doesn't have any substance to it. It's all falling apart constantly. It doesn't have that uh, kind of possibility of keeping us in order. So, this is the greatest of the, of the uh, fruits, nothing higher. So now, King Ayatasattu declares himself a lay follower. Here's another very traditional way of uh, uh, way of saying that. I will read it to you. Now, when the exalted one had finished speaking, King Ayatasattu said to him, Excellent, venerable sir, excellent, venerable sir, just as if one were to turn upright what had been turned upside down, 
or to reveal what was hidden, or to point out the right path to one who was lost, or to bring a lamp into a dark place so that those with keen sight could see forms. In the same way, Venerable Sir, the Exalted One has revealed the Dhamma in numerous ways. I go for refuge to the Exalted One, to the Dhamma and to the Sangha. Let the Exalted One accept me as a lay follower gone for refuge from this day onwards as long as I live. It's a very standard traditional way of saying it that is so excellent that it, has, it is being now revealed as if it was dark before. And that's really one aspect of it because everything is completely different from the way it is used in the world. And now the king is doing something very interesting. It's a confession, which actually doesn't have any part in this uh, tradition, but uh, it does make one feel better if one can tell somebody what one has done. <laughs> and he says, Venerable Sir, a transgression overcame me. I was so foolish, so deluded, so unskillful that for the sake of rulership I took the life of my own father, a righteous man and a righteous king. Let the exalted one acknowledge my transgression as a transgression for the sake of my restraint in the future. So he's asking the Buddha to acknowledge that he knows that the king has done this and that in the future he will not repeat such a dreadful thing. So now, the Buddha says, yes, indeed, great king, a transgression overcame you. You were so foolish, so deluded, so unskillful, that for the sake of rulership you took the life of your father, a righteous man and a righteous king. But since you have seen your transgression as a transgression and make amends for it according to the Dhamma, we acknowledge it. It really sounds like confession, doesn't it? Made, the, made his confession, so he's absolved, isn't it? Um, but that's not the case. It comes different afterwards. Um, for great king, this is growth in the discipline of the noble one, that a person sees his transgression as a transgression, makes it mend for it according to the Dhamma, and achieves a strength in the future. So he acknowledges the fact that he has made this confession, and that He's making amends for it by he's sorry about it and that in the future he will not do such a thing again. When this was said, King Ayatasattu said to the Exalted One, Now, Venerable Sir, we must go. We have many tasks and duties. Do whatever seems fit, great king. Then King Ayatasattu rejoiced in the words of the Exalted One and thanked him for it. Rising from his seat, he paid homage to the Exalted One circumambulated him and departed. Circumambulating a, an arahant is a, a show of great respect. Soon after King Ayatusattu had left, the exalted one addressed the monks. This king monk has ruined himself. He has injured himself. If this king had not taken the life of his father, then in this very seat, there would have arisen in him the dust-free, stainless eye of Dhamma. Thus spoke the Exalted One. Elated in mind, the monks rejoiced in the Exalted One's words. Here ends the Samana Pala Sutta. So the Buddha says, if he hadn't done this terrible deed, in other words, if he hadn't made such dreadful karma, then while sitting there, he would have had the dust-free, stainless eye of Dhamma, which means he would have had at least one past moment. It could mean he could see that the king had taken it in very well, what he had been told. But because this karmic blockage was there, there was no way he could obtain a past moment. So he had to go, he would have to go, I think it's mentioned at some other place, um, that he will have to go actually to some very terrible rebirths until uh, coming back to human life and then attaining uh, the um, arahantship. But if that hadn't been the case, the Buddha could see that, that he would have been at least a stream mentor right then and there. And the dust-free, that is something that's often used, 
not having having little dust on one's eyes, on inner eyes, and stainless, stainless as, uh, without any any. Stainless is actually another translation also for nibbana, something which has absolutely no stains on it, and the eye of dhamma is. is uh, and another explanation for another word for past moment. So we have completed this whole sutta, and you can see that the whole pathway is two things, serenity and insight. And there's an explain also a quotation here from the Buddha's discourses about serenity and insight. Now this is an uh, explanation also at the at the path after the path moment. While the noble eightfold path is being developed, thus the four foundations of mindfulness also go on to fulfillment through development and the four right efforts and the four bases of psychic power and the five spiritual faculties and the five parts of the wrong translation and the four bases of spiritual of power the four idipadas the four pathways of power the four pathways of power I've explained them to you the four pathways of power The five spiritual faculties, the five powers, the seven factors of enlightenment go on to fulfillment through development. These are the 37 factors of enlightenment. So after the past moment, all these are being developed and brought to fulfillment. Now obviously in order to have the first past moment, one has already some of that uh, under the belt. But as, as the past moment has happened, the first one, these really seem to be moving along as if of their own accord. It's, uh, it's not that one uh, doesn't think about it, but the thinking about them and the relating to them, I think that's a better word, to, the relating to these 37 factors of enlightenment seems to be natural after the first past moment. And these 37 factors of enlightenment, the Noble Eightfold Path, the first one, the mi- Mindfulness Foundations, the Four Right Efforts, the uh, Four Pathways to Power, Five Spiritual Faculties and Five Spiritual Powers, which are the same, and Seven Factors of Enlightenment. And in him, these two things occur, coupled together, serenity and insight. Coupled together. There's no way that one gets one without the other. It doesn't matter which way one approaches it. Sometimes people have to get a bit of insight first to get some serenity. In fact, they might have to get a lot of insight before they get serenity. Some have to get a lot of serenity before they get any insight. But every little bit of one helps the other. Those things that should be fully understood by direct knowledge are fully understood by direct knowledge. No, no, direct knowledge is the understood experience. These things that should be aban- abandoned by direct knowledge are abandoned. Those things that should be developed by direct knowledge are developed. And those things that should be realized by direct knowledge he realizes by direct knowledge. Now, if you remember that was said about the Four Noble Truths, the understanding and the abandoning. Understanding is understanding the First Noble Truth, that Dukkha is. No matter if we stand on our heads and scream, it is. There's no way out except through this, through the Enlightenment factor. And the uh, abandoning, abandoning of craving, then developing is the Noble Eightfold Path, and the realization is the Third Noble Truth of Nibbana. And direct knowledge means experiencing it oneself. 
all four of them. So this is uh, again a quotation out of the sutta, a different sutta, which uh, where the Buddha sort of gives the results of having the past moments. This uh, serenity and insight, calm and insight, samatha and vipassana, are often also shown to have two different results in the liberation, in the liberation, in the final liberation. And uh, they're called citta vimutti and panya vimutti. Now citta is the mind, which also means, of course, the jhanic development, development of mind. And panya is wisdom, which means the development of insight. So citta vimutti and panya vimutti, the two liberations. But they are not either or. They are both. It just depends which pathway one has taken. If one doesn't take the pathway of one, one can't take the other one either. So the one who has started out with doing everything to gain insight will eventually have to do everything to gain serenity and vice versa. Both of them are necessary for the completeness of the path. Let's see what the Buddha has to say about that, if anything. Nothing. <laughs> Not in here. Not there. A minute. Ah, here we are. Deliverance is of two kinds, mind and wisdom. And here it's explained in a different way. It's not uninteresting. By deliverance of mind in the highest sense, one has to understand the kind of concentration, samadhi, samadhi is the Pali word for concentration, which is bound up with the path of arahantship by deliverance through wisdom. The knowledge bound up with the fruition of arahantship. So, One has to that kind of concentration. So what is said here is that the deliverance of mind is a concentration for the path and the con con de deliverance through wisdom is the fruit. So that's a different way of explaining it. The, um, it's a commentary explanation. So the commentary explains that, that these are two different kinds, that the deliverance of mind and the deliverance of wisdom, one is through the concentration for the arahantship, which is the path, and wisdom is the fruition. So citta vimutti is the path moment, and panya vimutti the fruit moment, which is a commentary explanation. But usually the, the explanation that we have found in the suttas is one goes to the pathway, through the jhanas first, citta vimutti, and gains the pathway through insight from that. And the other can go through the pathway of the insight and gains the jhanas after that. So that is also often explained like that. But here is explained as that as the citta vimutti being path and panya vimutti being fruit, fruit moment. Either way, um, The fruit moment is the moment when one knows. That's quite true. But with, without the insight to actually go for that, it wouldn't be possible. And without the concentration to go for that, it wouldn't be possible either. So one really has to have both in order to do that. 
So, now we're all the way to enlightenment. <laughs> What's missing? <laughs> the doers, <laughs> there aren't any. <laughs> There's only the deed. <laughs> okay, do you have any questions? Hmm? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yes. Well, if it's understood that way, that would then it would be the same. It is often considered to be that into which one can dissolve into. But if I dissolve into that, then there's me that can dissolve into something. But if I have a delusion of me. I can't dissolve into anything. So if I understand that way, that as a delusion of me, and then there is only that other thing, then it's all right, if whatever it's called, whether it's Atman or Nirvana. At least that's how I've intellectually understood. Yes, if there is only that, right. and it's not me dissolving right. into it, but me as a delusion, but the other is, then it's the same thing. Yes. And I think that in Advaita Vedanta, it's, it's understood that way. Yeah. But I'm, although I tried for 10 years to understand it, I have to admit that I don't think I ever did. <laughs> it was, it was not uh, clear enough to me. <laughs> but uh, that would be right if that's the way it is understood. Okay, anything else? Yes. There's a Tibetan story uh, that made quite an impression on me about using power. There was this monk who studied with his master for a long time finally went off to be a hermit and spent 20 years in the wilderness by himself and learned to walk on the water. So he could walk across the stream that flowed in, in front of where he lived so he could go down to the village to get on or whatever he was doing. And after 20 years, his master comes and shows his master that he can walk across the water. And the master says, you fool, you've wasted 20 years of your life. So there's a bridge a quarter mile down the <laughs> 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 That's right. <laughs> That's very nice. <laughs> very good. <laughs> I heard something similar too, yes. Um, when, when you, I have clarified what you said about um, The jhanas, the experience of the jhanas, the experience of meditation, the experience of metta, and insight. These aren't the world? No, unfortunately, that is not so. They're still the world. Yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> <laughs> That's still all the world, and it's okay. still anicca dukkha anatta. Okay. It's only when we give up the delusion that there's somebody there that's getting all that stuff or not getting all that stuff that then when the world stops. The uh, super mundane starts actually after the dispassion um, and when after the desire for deliverance. After that starts the super mundane. So the insights that we get on the path are all directed towards our experiences, which are all in the world, right? And then when we get really dispassionate about that and really don't want that anymore because it's not, doesn't bring anything, then we can turn towards that which is not the world. The mundane and the super mundane. Right? Grow, has grow, more growth and more sunrise, and, 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 and that. So that 
Oh, yeah. It has positivities and negativities in it, but none of them are totally satisfying. I mean, not even the positivities. The negativities, certainly not. Right. <laughs> but at this stage, all of us would want the No, maybe come back next year, okay? <laughs> and we'll do it again. <laughs> Sure, sure, that's fine. Yes, of course. Yes. Hmm? Yes, Michael. Um, maybe you talked about this more in the first retreat in 10 minutes, but did you talk a little bit about the role of metta in, in all this? I, I don't think it was mentioned in the sutta. No, it's certainly not uh, mentioned in this sutta at all. Um, didn't I talk about it at all in this retreat? Maybe a little bit. Maybe a little bit. <laughs> okay, I'll run it. <laughs> well, uh, we have, you know, the four supreme efforts, which are the, for the thoughts, right? Which are the purification of the thought system, which means substituting anything that's unwholesome with the wholesome. Well, we have exactly the same purification system, for our emotions, namely substituting all of all our unwholesome emotions with the wholesome ones. And there are only four kinds of wholesome emotions. In fact, there are only four kinds of useful emotions, and they are like um, headings, those four. And they are metta, karuna, mudita, upeta, which metta is the one you're asking about, Mudita's compassion. Uh, um, uh, sorry, Karuna's compassion. Mudita is joy with others, and Upeka is equanimity. So we have love, and compassion, joy with others, and equanimity. Now, under those headings, you can also put in the devotion and uh, um, confidence and faith and uh, gratitude. All that goes with the giving of love. Right, all belongs in there. Now these are the four Brahma Viharas, the four, four divine abidings. These are the four um, supreme emotions. All others you can let go of. So what you do is with those is that as you develop them, you constantly try to substitute anything that doesn't fall under those categories, which is obviously negative, something that's very easily understood. If you hate somebody, it's easily understood that it's not very positive. But even if you dislike something, even then you realize that you can substitute with the opposite. The substitution of opposites is the most important aspect of purification. Now, these are the two purification systems which we can do in everyday life. The other purification system are the jhanas, or for that matter, any concentration. Any moment of concentration is a moment of purification. But the two aspects in daily life are the substitution of thought and substitution of emotion from the unwholesome to the wholesome. And another purification system is bare attention, mindfulness. Paying full attention to what one is doing. Because during the time of paying full attention, there's no way that one become negative. But if one has starting, it's our viewpoints and our reactions which bring the negativities. And if we let go of the viewpoints and let go of the reactions, and it's, it's the reactions which actually bring about the viewpoints. Because the reactions are based on our ego illusion and they are concerned with greed and hate as overall topics again, with all sorts of uh, uh, minor topics underneath. 
um, I mean, fear is also hate. So when we have a reaction, spontaneous, impulsive reaction to something, what somebody said, right? Because it is obviously something that does not support my ego illusion, right? Doesn't support me, whatever it is that somebody said. Immediately a view arises, that person is not nice. So it's our reactions to what we hear, see, to all our sense contacts, which bring about the, the viewpoint. And all of that is so bothersome, to put it very mildly, Make, makes life such a nuisance. Every, every bit of this makes life difficult. So instead of having all this going on, just substituting all the unwholesome with the wholesome and being totally mindful. And then there's no reaction because there cannot be, man cannot react and be mindful at the same time. It's either or. So we have a three-pointed purification system in daily life and plus that we have to use also the meditative purification system because otherwise it doesn't have enough uh, strength the purification. So that's the purpose of it. Is that what you wanted to hear? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> a little sub-question. Yes. What, what is equanimity uh, substituted for? Anxiety, uh, upset, um, excitement, and particularly any of these uh, which are uh, caused by the um, reaction to either the desirable or the undesirable. When the reaction comes to, ev- to, that, to that what we think is desirable or that is undesirable, then the substitution to, for that will be equanimity. Well, well, it is. uh, The bare attention, the mindfulness, is of course concentration. It's not as one-pointed as a jhana concentration, but it certainly is concentration as far as um, our momentary activity is concerned. You see, as if the mindfulness becomes narrower and narrower, it becomes concentration. But if you were mindful every every moment, then you'd have some concentration if you had the ability to do that. I mean, each step... It usually works around the other way. (laughs) (laughs) If if you're able to concentrate well in meditation, you're usually able to be mindful in daily life. But you can, you always have to work on both levels. You try mindfulness in daily life, you try meditation, concentration. But it's usually when your concentration comes together in the meditation because you can be very, you can give a lot of time to that, you know, because you can sit and sit and sit, um, then the mindfulness becomes much easier. Uh, Carol, yes. Mm, well, metta can be felt uh, in the second jhana very often, but it is not uh, ever mentioned by the Buddha as one of the factors to uh, develop the four supreme emotions. The f- to develop them, well, the... Um, You need a little bit of insight for them too, but to develop loving kindness is uh, the loving kindness meditation and the substitution in daily life. The far enemy of loving kindness is hate, which is obvious. The near enemy is attachment. The far enemy of compassion is cruelty. The near enemy is pity. The far enemy of 
joy with others is envy. The near enemy of uh, joy with others is hypocrisy. The far enemy of equanimity is excitement and the near enemy is indifference. The near enemy is always called the near enemy because it's similar, it looks similar, but it certainly isn't the same. So the development of uh, equanimity comes through insight and certainly through the fourth jhana. And loving kindness through first and second because they suppress anger. I mean, they don't uproot it. It's always back but they certainly do something about it. But it was not enough. One has to do it in daily life. Everybody has so many opportunities. Every day, one sees and meets so many people. Everybody has these opportunities. And uh, that's when we really have to practice it. Yes, yes, it is, it is helpful. In fact, it may become a quite a normal thing to do. Um, certainly, it's, it's helpful to recall them, even just in memory, to bring it up, because it shows one a different reality. And that makes it easier then, makes it easier to have those uh, feelings. That's quite right, yes. Buddha did not mention that, but he did mention that the first jhanas is an antidote for, I, I talked about that, for, uh, first jhana is the antidote for ill will. You know, that pleasant feeling. But only during the jhana. So if you bring it up, certainly. That's, a, that's uh, very right. Same thing, at, uh, strongly, okay. strongly. And how how is that different, or is it than repressing? Like, mm. you know, people repress. So yes, are yes. Are we repressing things? Or no. We Suppression and repression are not the same thing. Repression is you don't want to know. You have no idea. It's down, down. It's all sitting in here, okay. and it's a big blockage. You can't get at it, but you can't go anywhere either because it's completely uh, blocking everything. That's a repression. But the suppression is that you know it, but you're putting it down. Now, hopefully, it's not going to come up, but it will. All of these things come up again and again until insight has uprooted them. But suppression just means that you know exactly what you've got hate and dislike and whatever. But during the first jhana, it's suppressed. And this is a strong um, helpmate, a very strong helpmate. It helps enormously. But repression is you don't allow it to come up at all. You don't know it. And that's dangerous. That can be very detrimental to one's practice. Anything else? Put the attention on the breath for just a few moments, please. Now unlock the door of your heart and see whether there are any hindrances there. Hindrances like anxiety, restlessness, sensual desire, planning for next week after the retreat. And if so, Let them float away. 
let them float away like a black cloud. Let a beautiful, big, white cloud come in picture now. This cloud contains loving kindness, gratitude, appreciation, care, and wrap yourself up in it. Feel the softness, the warmth of loving kindness. Send this beautiful cloud to the person sitting next to you, filling and surrounding him or her with loving kindness and gratitude, appreciation. Now let this cloud flow from one person to the other, thanking each other for sharing this month, feel the warmth of appreciation and friendship for each other. Wrap each other up with loving kindness. Let the cloud embrace your parents, thanking them for what they've done for you when you were still depending on them. Fill and surround them with appreciation, with gratitude and respect.
let this beautiful cloud reach your dearest and nearest. Filling them with loving kindness without asking anything in return. Think of the people you see every day, people you work with, neighbors, acquaintances, and relatives. Send them a beautiful, soft cloud, full of loving kindness. friendship and understanding. Now there might be someone you've had an argument with. Know that angry people are always unhappy people. So forgive yourself and the other person for whatever you might have said to each other. so that you can start listening to each other again. Send this beautiful cloud to this person. and share in appreciation. Think of all the unhappy people in this world, people who are mentally ill, people addicted to drugs or alcohol, depressed people, send them this cloud of friendship of loving kindness and compassion. Wrap them up in it.
Now visualize this cloud as big as the earth. Let it slowly come down to the surface of the globe and let it pervade all the living beings. Let it bring purity in people's hearts. understanding and friendship for each other. Put your attention back on yourself. Feel the warmth, the tenderness of loving kindness. Of gratitude in your heart. feeling as if there were a blanket wrapped around you, protecting you. Keep it there. May all beings have love and appreciation for each other.